we go. Um, all right, well, uh, welcome everybody to the session that Kate's going to be presenting. Uh, it's going to be cataloging for the non-cataloger, how knowing cataloging and uh, can help you, sorry, in your library job. So uh, this will be the last presentation that we'll have uh, for today on this track. Uh, we do have a social hour that will start at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard or 3 p.m. on Pacific time. Uh, so join us for that. We'll probably have a separate room available. Uh, we'd like to thank our sponsors. The champion sponsors for this conference are Emerald Data, Equinox, and Mobius. Equinox being our platform sponsor and Emerald Data sponsoring the caption. Uh, so the live captioning link is posted. Uh, this will be recorded and available on our public YouTube after the conference, and the slides will also be submitted to our website afterwards. I think that's it for me, but if you have any questions for Kate throughout the presentation, uh, feel free to put in chat and I'll make sure that she gets it. All right, I think you're good to go now. Okay, hey everyone. I'm going to leave my video on just long enough to introduce myself and then I'm going to shut it off um, just in case I have any bandwidth to choose. Um, oh, you know what? Hang on just a minute, sorry. All right, let's 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 start over. So uh, welcome to Cataloging for Non-Catalogers. I'm hoping today that I can provide you some useful information about how knowing something about cataloging can help you in your job. And let's see here. So I am Kate Coleman. I'm the Technical Services Manager at Jefferson County Library. Um, we've been a member of the Missouri Evergreen Consortium since 2017. So I've been waiting around in Evergreen for about five years now. I'm also the Evergreen contact for my library, which simply means that I contact Equinox, who hosts and supports us several times a week sometimes because I'm just fumbling around in, in Evergreen trying to figure everything out. Um, of import to this presentation, I will be celebrating 20 years as a cataloger this August. Um, and we'll see if I fill a whole hour here. I know I needed more than a half an hour, but I'm not sure if I can fill a whole hour. Um, on this slide, you will see the main things, uh, if you know me, that are important to me, coffee and cats. So um, again, I'm going to turn my camera off now just so I can circumvent any bandwidth issues I may have. All right. So bear with me just a second. Okay, here we go. So uh, this is a quote that I came across some years ago, and I think a lot of library workers have a certain idea about catalogers. Um, so this says the stereotype of a cataloger is for many, the hermit hiding in the bowels of the library, counting pages of plates and measuring the heights of books. On the rare occasion, he or she is led out of the dungeon. It's to be the one at the meeting who speaks in unintelligible markies about non-filing characters and second indicator blank and space colon space. Uh, the cataloger's role in the library is to enforce rules that nobody understands and to make things as difficult as possible for everyone involved. Well, thanks, Mr. Murray. Um, that kind of hurts, but one thing I've always said about cataloging is it takes a certain kind of library worker to be a cataloger. And uh, you can read into that what you will. So no matter the position in your library, your ability to do your job well depends on good cataloging. I was in a session yesterday at this conference and after some great discussion, someone in the chat said, it all comes back to cataloging, doesn't it? And it really does. A catalogers main job is to get the items in the hands of the people who need them, whether that is staff or patrons. Uh, we call this discoverability, and it's really the whole premise of what cataloging is. Subject headings and genre headings, authorized access points, contents notes, summary notes, blah, blah, blah. That's some of that marquees, I guess, that Mr. Murray was talking about. Um, it all means something, though, and broken down, it can be helpful to any and all jobs in your library system. 
we're kind of all familiar with the rumored death of libraries because of technology, but those of us on this side of things know that technology has vastly improved how we can provide services. So these are some of the specific departments that we're going to talk about today. If you're here and you feel like you don't fit into one of these categories, I'm sorry. As a technical services librarian, I can commiserate. Um, so first, we're going to talk about in what ways some cataloging knowledge can help these library departments, and then we'll dive into some actual cataloging. But don't worry, I won't say non-filing characters even once. So our first stop along the library path is references, reference or adult services. Um, reference and adult service library workers do tons of stuff, right? But you especially want to be able to answer those questions. The key to that all important reference interview and helping with readers advisory with your local materials is knowing how to get them in the catalog. Uh, reference interviews can get pretty deep, right? You may remember learning about the WEMI model, work, expression, manifestation, item at some point. Cataloging and knowing a little bit about it can really help make sense of that practice to be able to get your patron exactly what they need. Being able to get an effective search by not simply doing a keyword search, it's a powerful thing. So with youth services, um, did you know that cataloging juvenile materials is actually a bit different for some libraries and especially types of libraries? If your library uses juvenile subject headings, they are coded a bit differently, um, which means that they have to be coded so they display correctly. Um, school libraries use SEER subject headings, whereas public libraries often stick to Library of Congress subject headings. Uh, these are key things to know to have an effective search in your catalog. Searching by reading level like Lexile or DRA could be super helpful to children, li children's library workers. Um, and of course, your programming is often based on your materials of a certain subject. So don't miss out on that perfect resource for your program. Children's library workers know the drill. A kid or their parents come in the day before the science project is due, or a kiddo comes in and wants to know any and everything about boogers. We can help with that. Who doesn't love a good search for booger related materials? So uh, you can see uh, under our booger book here, um, that's kind of what uh, subject headings for this book might look like. So you might think that you could go into your catalog and search boogers and yeah, a keyword search would bring up this, this book because you put in boogers. But um, if you put in mucus as the subject heading, you could get lots of books about boogers, even if the word booger isn't in the title. I have said booger more in the last minute than I have in the last year. <laughs> so when you're looking a title up in the pack, you're using that information that catalogers enter into the mark record to actually locate that item. Um, the knowledge of how this goes into the bib record can help you explain to patrons why they may be having difficulties finding something. Um, those helpful faceted search results are created from the mark fields in the bib records. Uh, the classification of an item is also in the bib record, including cutter numbers. So in Evergreen, um, you may or may not have the faceted search set to display in Evergreen on your pack side. Uh, we had to turn it on in our consortium. Um, and we think it's great. We've had really good feedback from both staff and patrons. Um, but when you do have it dis displayed, a list of related searches comes up alongside the search results. So those extra clickable results come straight from the cataloging record and are essentially showing search results from your search results. And they show adjacent, relevant, and uh, or related searches you could do with your search terms. There are authors and topical subjects, genres, series titles and geographical headings. Uh, also, pro tip here, if you notice on the side there, um, those topical subject heading results on the faceted search, those include your digital book plates. So as you can see there, um, we have a digital book plate for some of our friends groups that donated something. And so uh, that comes up there too. 
So uh, you see in my search here, I did a keyword search for libraries. It gives me links I could click on to get items that could be of use. Um, those faceted search results that can be of so much help to both staff and patrons come straight from the bib records. Not only do they give you potential additional search terms, but they let you limit your search results to only audiobooks or juvenile audio, uh, juvenile audio items. Goodness. Um, so all of that is coded in the bib records. Okay, I'm going to admit that pretty much none of this makes sense to me, but I've been told that these are ways systems and IT staff can benefit from knowing some cataloging. Um, by understanding MARC records, you can build APIs using the MARC fields and can use SQL to query the database using those MARC fields. I hope I'm saying all these things right. Um, does your setting up of Evergreen use UTF-8 or MARC-8 character sets, and what does that even mean? Do you have to send files and bib records to vendors maybe, knowing the key fields of what they're asking for um, those vendors? We just had to send uh, a whole bunch of records to our new locker. Uh, we have locker pickup now for our holds, and I had to, to get a whole bunch of information from our MARC records to, to put into those. And um, just generally speaking, the language and having that common frame of reference can make all the difference in communication between IT and staff. Um, after the presentation, if you know what any of this stuff means, uh, I'd love to hear from some sysadmin people to hear their experiences. And I love it. Elizabeth says a cataloger can be her best friend when she's trying to build reports. Yes, we love friends in cataloging because we're, you know, back in those dungeons. So in collection development, you can really use um, the MARC records to see if you're lacking a certain genre. Are you working on your diversity and representation in your libraries? Um, how many items do you have pertaining to that local ghost story? Or is that special collection you spent so much time researching last year just not circling like you wish it was? Um, maybe what books are you missing in that popular series? The key to collecting that information is running the reports, again, that pull information from our MARC records. But which fields? The collaboration between catalogers and the collection development team could be one of the most important in your library system. Um, so you can really help create effective workflows between the two um, with just a little more knowledge of some cataloging. And then our last stop in our road is for admin. Um, if you're in an admin position in your library, knowing some cataloging will help you maybe gather the information needed to make the case for your library to maybe your board or your community and even your elected officials regarding the value of your library. Um, it will also help generally support your staff across the board for many reasons, but maybe most importantly is knowing what your staff knows. Uh, also, did you know that your catalogers often contribute to the creation and ongoing development of international databases, catalogs, and authority files? That is something that those very important people could be impressed to hear. Please realize that no catalog is perfect, especially if you're in a consortium catalog. I have definitely learned that over the last five years. Um, the catalogers are part of your library team, and who better to inform us, the catalogers, of mistakes in the catalog than all of you. You're coming across titles in your day-to-day -day work, maybe even more than we are. So if you know how to figure out what may be causing issues and identify the problems in the records, you can do your job better, and you can help us uh, you can relay that information to us much quicker. So informing your cataloging staff of mistakes you find enables them to fix it quickly and improve access to those items. And how many of you in this room are from smaller libraries and wear more than one hat? So if you have limited staff and limited hours, the importance of knowing some cataloging is doubled. This is one of my favorite quotes as a cataloger. Uh, a resource sitting on the shelf helps no one unless it's findable. Remember all the wonderful things we have in our libraries are of no use unless they are discoverable. 
So I've tried my hardest to cover the why of knowing a bit of cataloging and we're only 15 minutes in. Um, so now we're gonna show you a little bit of how. Um, there are so many mark record fields, but knowing even just a key handful of them will help you. So for starters, many of you might not even know how to look at a mark record. Um, so how do you even take a peek at the mark record in Evergreen? When you bring up your title, there are two mark options. Going to the Mark View tab, and the record will be outlined for you there. Um, if you go to the Mark View tab, then you can't mess up any of our good cataloging. We'll kind of touch on that later, but um, everybody is safe using the Mark View tab. You can't mess anything up. So here are some of the mark fields that you should know, and these are all of our numbers. So ISBNs and UPCs, the 020 and the 024 field, which the 024 isn't in this example, but 020s are your ISBNs. 024s are what you're gonna mostly see on maybe media materials. They're your UPC codes. Um, they can help you ensure that you have the right title, although, Occasionally, ISBNs can be reused and other things can happen, so always check. Don't rely exclusively on an ISBN to identify an, an item. Um, and in 035, there is your OCLC number. Uh, OCLC is an international database of cataloging records. Um, this is another way to make sure you have your item you need. OCLC is also used as the base for ILL for many libraries, and the OCLC number can ensure you're requesting the title you want rather than a different edition or format. So in numbers as well, we have um, the 050 is an LC classification. Um, those of course are used most of the time in academic libraries and our 082 is our Dewey numbers, um, used of course more commonly in public libraries. Um, there are extensive rule sets for building the correct numbers to ensure that those items uh, on similar topics are shelved near one another. Uh, we could teach a week-long class on uh, classification, but um, just know that if you have something in hand and you're like, this, this uh, Dewey number doesn't seem right, you can maybe pop in here and look at that 082 and say, yeah, the, the spine label doesn't actually match what the call number is supposed to be. So that could help you answer a question quickly there. Um, your 250 is your edition statement. So, um, you know, some of the, those rough materials or nonfiction things that get pubbed every year. Um, if you want, you, this would help you know if it's the third edition or the 11th edition. Um, the three, the 264 is uh, where we record publication information. So your pub dates and your, um, and your, let's see, your pub dates and your uh, publisher and all that, that stuff that's in your 264. And then your 300 is where um, the physical description is. So the size of the item and the page numbers and, and that kind of thing. So um, this could help if, if you're, you have something in hand maybe, and you're like, I don't know if this is on the right record or something. It doesn't match the page numbers. It doesn't match, you know, and don't rely on covers always in your um, catalog either, because as we know, those usually come from third parties and we can't rely on them 100%. Let's see. So note too that above the mark fields, um, there are some fixed fields. Uh, we will talk about all of that scary stuff in a little bit. So these are access points and titles that um, are important to know. And again, um, these, the last slide and this slide are, are just meant for you to be able to kind of browse that mark record and look and see if, uh, if anything stands out to you or if something's wrong, if it could, um, jump out at you and help you identify the things you do and don't want. So um, your 100 field, that's going to be your author. If there are added authors or an illustrator, we know that those are really important in children's items. Those go down below in the 700. 
we can only have one person in that 100 field. So if it's written and or illustrated by more than that, then we're going to add them in that 700 field. And that also makes them searchable in the catalog for that item. Um, a 110 is a corporate author that's not in this uh, example, but, you know, sometimes the, you know, Heart Foundation or something puts something, you know, they publish something. So that would be in a 110. Um, the 245 could, you know, probably the most important field that there is. That, that is our um, title and uh, title statement and our authors. And that stuff is taken straight from the title page. Now, if you've ever had something and you're like, you see the title in the catalog and you're not, and you're like, that's not what's on the cover. That's because what's in the 245 is going to be what's on the title page. Now, if the title cover is different, there should be a 246 in there, which is an added title. So both of those should be searchable, but um, we get our 245 information because it's called, technically it's called the title proper. So um, that we get that information from the title page. Uh, the 490 is a very important series title. Um, I am a series lover myself, so um, I'm always happy to learn if it's uh, part of a series. Our 600s, those are, um, when we get into 600s, those are subject headings of, of all types. So 600s, that's somebody's name. So that means that this book and this example is about Katherine Johnson. Um, she's not the author. She's she is didn't write this book, but um, Miss Gina she wrote it about Miss Johnson, so that's why uh, Catherine Johnson's in a six hundred, and the six fifty is a subject heading. So six fifties are what the book is about, as opposed to a six fifty five, which is a genre heading, which is what a book is. This book isn't about a biography. This book is a biography. This book is about physicists. It's not a physicist, so it's not a 655. The 650 is, a, is for subject headings for what the item is about, and the 655 is for what the item is. And then um, you can barely see it down there because my, uh, my lovely screen grab uh, program cut it off, but um, when you have a 490 series title, um, more often than not, you will have a series tracing for an 830. So that, um, again, that's cataloging talk um, for how it's displayed and searched for on the back end of our ILS. And then another big chunk of a mark record is just um, notes fields. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, the 5XX fields are the note fields. Um, some of the common notes are 500. That's a, just a general note. You can see a 504 here. That's the field for if it contains bibliographic references and or an index. Uh, the 505 is for, generally speaking, for table of contents and stuff like that. And the 520 is your summary field. Um, Something that is important that's not on this example, um, 511 is for your performers for music and that kind of thing. Um, 520, uh, like I said, is your summary, but your 521 is your target audience. Let's see. Um, and a 586 is for awards. We use our reward, our awards um, fields very uh we use them a lot in, in our library. Um, if I wanted to search for a, a Hugo Award as a phrase search limited to general notes field, um, then I could get results that had that 586 in there. Uh, that could be a keyword search as well. Let's see. So, um, we always like to have a, a decent, especially for fiction, have a decent 520 summary field because um, those, if those are filled out well, then uh, it really does help in a keyword search. Um, you know, I, we can't get every single uh, subject heading in a title and sometimes the subject heading just isn't 
um, authorized, honestly. So uh, the the nomenclature that somebody uses might not actually be the authorized heading. So um, having a good uh, summary for that title can really help bring up um, things for your keyword searches as well. Okay, so the last three slides we had, that was a pretty general over, gener, you know, a general overview, and we did go through them pretty quickly. Th this stuff that we're going to see in the next several slides, th these do go a little bit deeper, and this, this could be scary. Um, I feel like there could be a whole presentation about what fixed fields do for us in the catalog, uh, but we're going to really skim the surface here um, because these fixed fields really are important uh, with Evergreen. So yes, this type of cataloging that could potentially send some library workers screaming, but um, I wanted to include this information with screenshots uh, in mind that somebody could be using this after our meeting today. Um, they could be looking at our slide deck to try to help them out. So in Evergreen, the things the, that drive the record icons that you see there circled, your DVD and your large print book, um, they are driven by our fixed fields here. So fixed fields are complicated and they're mysterious things, even sometimes for catalogers, uh, but they're gonna be your number one culprit if your icons are displaying incorrectly or not at all. So for these two examples, um, I'll use our consortium's two most prevalent culprits, which is AV materials, media materials, and large print items. Um, so on the left there, you'll see a DVD record that is showing the DVD icon. Um, if that icon wasn't there or it was displaying incorrectly, there's a, I'm going to say 97% chance that it is that 007 down there that that arrow is pointing to. And um, if there's no icon whatsoever, that usually means the 007 is missing altogether. Um, but if it's displaying incorrectly, um, that usually means that it's coded incorrectly. So for large prints, on the other hand, a different fixed field is most likely the culprit. So you see that big long line of just jibberty jabber there. It's just the character line of stuff. And that one field there, that one character field, that D, that is what drives that icon to make it large print. So yep, that one character is likely what is wrong. Um, that character right there is also what makes the Braille icon show. So let's look at this stuff a little closer. Again, don't run scared or anything. So we're going to take this fixed field stuff just one step further to take you to be able to show you a different view. So if you have the correct permissions in Evergreen, you can look at the Mark Edit tab there. You see I have that circled, and you're going to want to look at the Enhanced Mark Editor as opposed to the flat text, which is right there beside it. Um, now, don't go in there and start changing stuff around unless you know what you're doing or you're under the supervision of a cataloger. Um, but I just wanted to get you familiar with kind of what is what. Because when looking at the bib this way, those fixed fields are laid out in such a way that they're much more user friendly. Yes, this um, all of these codes might not mean anything to you, but um, it's better than reading that string of just letters that's down there in that uh, 008 field down there that's the arrows pointing to. And I'll kind of show you how one translates into the other. So when you look at fixed fields in that grid view here, the enhanced view, um, there are several boxes in which you can right click, which brings up a helpful list of what those codes mean, and they can help you choose which one you need. So not only does this drive the icon, but like in this instance, those one letter codes translate into a whole advanced search filter on the patron side. So this type here that's circled is an A, which means books. So if you're looking over here in your search filters, if I were to click books here, that came straight from this type here in our fixed fields. 
And the same could be said for, you know, video recordings and all of that. Um, if a patron wants to search a specific title, they can limit it to just the audiobooks or ebooks or videos, thanks to this one letter in the fixed field. Um, on the staff side or the OPEC, if something isn't showing up in the search results and you can't understand why, this would be a good place to look. So right clicking on this type box gives you a pretty comprehensive list on what codes can be used. Um, these are your most often used uh, codes. There are a lot more from the Library of Congress, but these are definitely our most often used ones. So another box in those fixed fields, um, you can see here, back here is that, that grid view again. Um, the literary form filter on the pack side is driven by this lit F here. So this one little letter here does some pretty heavy lifting for searching and filtering. Uh, we use this a lot in our library, making sure that our poetry and essay collections use these codes correctly. So a patron could find something to help with our poetry contest or for an essay submission. Um, most often, I will say there is usually just a one or a zero in there, which simply means uh, fiction or nonfiction. Um, but being able to put that granularity can be so helpful to both staff and patrons. Um, another one that you can kind of see there is uh, a language filter. You can see that here in the search filters. That again comes from another field here in the fixed fields. Um, let's see. So a lot of a lot of stuff comes from these fixed fields. That's why they they tend to be the most confusing, but of course that often means they're the most important. Um, so like I said, another big problem culprit for us in our consortium is displaying the icons of AV materials and MIDI materials. So this is often uh, a different area of a fixed field called an 007. You can see that here where the arrow is. So um, when you're using that enhanced view, um, you can see here, that's where our grid was. And down here, you can see this 007 as opposed to this 007 in the marked view. Um, when you're using that enhanced view, there is a handy wizard here that pops up and that's what this is. And it guides you through each character position for that 007 field. I'm, you don't have to know what all of this stuff means because you'll go through and click next, 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 and you have a menu, a drop down menu here, and you say, Yes, this is a video recording. Yes, it's, you know, for, for LP records, there's, you know, groove position. And I mean, this gets very extensive. Um, but for example, if a Blu ray is displaying as a DVD, this 007 field is where it's at. That's the one single place that will change that icon in Evergreen. Um, and I think that really is a perfect example of why cataloging seems like a hill people don't want to climb. So much can go wrong with just one letter, one little character position and a string of letters. Um, so I know that sounds crazy, but cataloging is essentially coding metadata. And so, yep, one little letter can mean a whole lot. Uh-oh, and Elaine says there's a bug in 3.8 that deletes all the codes in the 007 when you start scrolling through. Oh, don't tell me that. Uh, I'm glad she, Elaine mentioned 3.8, though, because I, I am using 3.8, some of my, uh, my screenshots, if they look a little different to you. Um, if you're not on 3.8, that could be why. All right. So... Why should you care about cataloging? You know, I think we, we've went through a lot of different departments um, and the number one answer is always going to be discoverability. Um, you have more effective searching and you can locate the items on the shelves better. Um, it helps you know about the, that faceted searching and those search results and where they came from and why you're seeing what you're seeing. Um, it shows you, it helps you understand why 
uh, evergreen displays the way it does and what what fields index in evergreen. Um, it definitely helps you run reports targeted more specifically to your needs and um, it helps you work collaboratively with catalogers for efficient workflow. Um, sometimes I, I know and not only in my consortium, but in my library, I depend so much on people that are out in the stacks, people that are with uh, patrons to bring problems to me to fix because I, in my day to day workflow, I'm certainly not going to come across the things that you guys on the front lines do. So, um, th and that's my job. I want to, I want to know the issues so I can fix them and help the end user, you know, locate what they want to do. And um, maybe most importantly, why should you care about cataloging? It's because the cool kids are doing it. So you want to be a cool kid. Um, I came across this uh, last quote and I really liked it. Only librarians like to search. Everyone else likes to find. So that's kind of what we're in this for. Um, we do all this, the searching, the hard work, the hard lifting so that uh, our patrons can find it. So I knew I didn't need a whole hour, but I didn't think I'd get through it in less than 40 minutes. Um, I did use some references for, for this stuff. Um, a lot of this stuff, uh, it's some good reading if you should ever want to take a dive into it. And then um, here's my contact information if anybody is interested. Um, I'm always ha happy to help uh, catalogers and non-catalogers alike. Um, I'm very active in the cataloging community in my consortium and I'm kind of the, the go-to person for all of that kind of stuff. And I have helped many a non-cataloger uh, figure some stuff out. So Benjamin in the chat says that he's always found it surprising that there are Dewey and LCC numbers in the bib record, given that each copy may use a different call number. Why is it there? And is there some clever way we can take advantage of this? Um, this comes into play a lot more with LC than Dewey, but um, in in MARC records, you know, the cutter number, of course, is the most important number is if you're going to go all out and make sure that each copy has a different call number. Um, I know we're a public library. We don't do that. Um, but so bib records that we get from our most common sources, OCLC, you know, vendors, stuff like that, they're not going to have a, you know, 16 digit cutter. And that is what um, you, you need for instances like that to have for each copy to have a different call number. So um, if your library does that, then your cataloger is going to need to, you know, dive more deeply into those cutter numbers. But generally speaking, that that base call number for both LC and Dewey are, are going to be the, the same. And that's kind of what is in a call it in the mark record is those base numbers where everything kind of jumps off from. And as far as is there some clever way we can take advantage of this? Um, <laughs> Elaine says, yeah, suffixes, of course, uh, copy one, copy two. Um, we just got a brand spanking new edition of the the DDC four volume set, 2022 edition. I'm, I was super excited to get it. I haven't had a new DDC in 12 years. Um, and that's where I would, you know, if we needed to go that deep for call numbers, I would, I would grab out my DDC and dig in and see what it needed to be. So I hope I have given you guys a bit of an introduction to maybe how cataloging might be useful for you and your job. Um, I'm definitely open for questions and discussion. Oh, and Jennifer Pringle says that Evergreen will populate the call number field in the holdings editor with the value from the 050 or the 082, depending on, depending on your default classification scheme. So that sounds like a setting as well that you can set on the back end there.
Yeah, if if there's a a launch pad bug, I definitely want to add heat for that. I haven't seen that yet, um, but I will definitely be adding heat to that if if there is one. Uh, Kate, would you be uh, open to having people also join the audiovisual uh, space, um, just in case, like you, you want to like discuss it and not have to? Oh, the art cataloging space. Yeah. yeah. Well, like, uh, you know, oh, I'm sorry. Um, I meant um, in the session, uh, but yeah, that that too. Um, if, if people want to uh, request um, audiovisual permissions to get into the session, if like what you're talking about is too much to type out, I see. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Please do. Yep, do that, and I'll uh, accept you in. Uh, we we do have about like twenty minutes left, so we we got plenty of time to uh, to talk. So yeah, if you have questions and it's easier for you to ask instead of typing it all out, go ahead and request access, and we can just let you let you speak. And we also have the cataloging interest group meeting tomorrow uh, at 3 to 4 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, that's going to be a track two. So if that's something you want to put in your calendar to look forward to. That's tomorrow at four. Yeah, the cataloging interest group, we work a lot um, with our other evergreen you know, communities of interest. And um, we've worked hand in hand with DIG. And um, I know Bill Erickson has come to several of our meetings and we kind of help guide him on what we need for the ILS. Um, it's been great. The, the cataloging community really likes to try to be helpful in any way we can across the board. All right, bug's been posted, so I'm going to add heat to this, too. Awesome. All right. In there. Yeah, and I, was, I also mentioned something in chat, too, um, that I learned programming before. I, I used to do cataloging or copy cataloging in the past, and um, it's funny how you just say, like, one uh, character could just throw off everything, and I feel like that's the same thing in programming, too. So I, I think that... Um, especially when we went from a acr 2 to RDA, um, that was a pretty big thing that helped train me to be better at syntax. I um, mean, I think overall that's made me a better programmer too. Yeah, I, I had several people that I, I helped through their cataloging course when they were getting their, you know, they were in their degree program. And um, I know for my program specifically, before we even did any cataloging, um, our professor had us go do some HTML coding and she's like, Oh, really? Cat yeah. Cataloging oh. is just another, you know, language. Yeah. It's just another programming yeah, right. language to learn. And um, I think that helps kind of contextualize it for some people because um, yes, when you're getting your MLS or your MLIS, um, sometimes you are forced to take that cataloging course and nobody really wants to do it, but <laughs> that can kind of help contextualize why, um, that it's not really any different than learning a coding language, maybe. Yeah, I also agree. Um, that's interesting that um, they let you or they uh, encourage you to do the HTML course first, uh, and, and well, at least in that instance. Um, yeah, that, hmm, I, I don't know. I've never really thought of it that way. I just always learned HTML first just because I took like a high school class before the uh, master's degree program. So yeah, that's cool. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> seems to uh, be very yeah I think it made a lot of sense to people like oh yeah that I can kind of see how that is similar so if you do have any more questions um I mean I'll be around but uh we do have the cataloging um drop-in space there uh, on the sessions page that is being monitored. Um, I know that some of you aren't catalogers at all. So you listen to this and you're hitting the road and you're like, okay, I don't really need to think about this again, but maybe think about it again. <laughs> okay, Kate, well, um, you know, if you're hanging in here, uh, you know, no, no worries if people need to ask those questions. Um, 
and yeah, that, that drop in speed, the breakout session too, is a really good place to go to. Um, so uh, this is again, the last presentation of today. We will be starting up again tomorrow at uh, 11 a.m. Uh, Eastern time to do the new feature highlights with uh, Ruth and Andrea uh, before we go into our breakout sessions from there. So uh, we do have a social hour coming up in about 45 minutes. We'll try to get a separate room set up for that. And you can just pop in there. We'll probably play like Jackbox games like we did last year or Among Us or something. Uh, but yeah, uh, nifty uh, little breakout sessions that you could go into for all those other topics that you could talk about. We have um, systems and administration, cataloging, uh, and documentation too. So please uh, make use of those rooms if uh, you would like to talk to other people outside of the presentations. Uh, but in any case, uh, thanks for uh, joining us today for our second day of the conference. And if you're coming to the social hour, I'll see you then. Otherwise, I'll see you tomorrow.